Well, I want to lay a bit of a foundation for how your church and how you can practically get involved in the political process because I think what's at stake is our effectiveness in evangelism. That's actually what's at stake. So if you want to tweet, you can, the, the, you'll see that the, the Twitter was just up there on the screen as well. Anything that you find um, worthwhile. So this, I, when we started on this journey, I met many, many pastors, many, many church leaders who had a great deal of resistance. Now, when I started on this journey, it was probably uh, 10 or 11 years ago. And I want to give some of the background to why we started on this journey. Um, we were called to Tasmania some 19 years ago, and I began to see that Tasmania was used. Uh, we were from Melbourne, we were in Williamstown, so we, we were since Tasmania, didn't know anybody. We, we arrived there unknown, uninvited, probably unwanted, and uh, took on a, a pioneer church, and we're in that church now, um, still 19 years later. And I began to realize that there was an Australian national policy agenda that was seed bedded in Tasmania. And that Tasmania, as one of the smallest states with a relatively fractured and disorganized collective church, had minimal resistance to that social agenda. Now, when I say social agenda, I mean the things that we as Christians should feel are important for all of society. And it's not that we're trying to Christianize society, it's that we actually care. And that's, for me, the driving motivation. The driving motivation for being involved in the political process is because we care for our society. So this is the, the, the most common accusation that I had leveled against me, that religion and politics simply don't mix. So I want to address that and I want to address some uh, other myths as well, because I think, as we've heard today, that is a myth. Religion and politics can only mix. So, it was uh, a very famous person who said this, and I, I put this on my, my Facebook wall the other day, and it's led to some people thinking that I'm no longer a Christian because I quoted a non-Christian, which is rather bizarre. But this was something that Mahatma Gandhi said, those who say religion has nothing to do with politics do not understand what religion is. And when I think about what religion is, and I'm using that in the sense that the world understands it, not how we might understand it, that Christianity doesn't just care. We don't just care for those that turn up in our church on a Sunday. We care for our community. We care for the broader community. So how far does our understanding of Christ's Lordship and Christ's care for society extend. And I want to show you that in 1970, I believe there was a, and I'm going to use this as a metaphor for how Christians can care. In 1970, legislation was introduced around Australia that we all now take for granted. And I think it was one of the greatest acts of care the Australian government has ever instituted. I'll come to that in a moment. If art, as we've heard, is a thermometer of culture, uh, we heard from Marcy that art reflects where culture's at, and if it's fair to say that politics is the barometer of culture, you know, you use a barometer to find out where the weather's you know, going. So if politics is an indication of the barometer, then it's certainly got to be true that Christianity should be the thermostat. We should have a role to play in the political process. So Christianity should be the thermostat. It shouldn't be the thermometer. We shouldn't be reflecting the world. And we certainly shouldn't be the world's barometer either. We should be the thermostat affecting the culture of, uh, of our society. So we know that art gives expression. It gives culture expression. We've seen Marcy beautifully unpack that to, uh, yesterday. And we know that uh, politics gives culture representation and in Australia we, over the next few years we're going to have a pretty rigorous debate about how that looks in the Senate um, and surely Christianity 
surely we can argue that Christianity gives culture inspiration. And if you've studied art, if you've studied the history of politics, you know that Christianity has been the single greatest factor in the inspiration of art and politics. It was Niall Ferguson who wrote Six Killer Apps. He's a, a Harvard professor. And he, the Six Killer Apps, he said, were the six things that made Western civilization far exceed any other culture in human history. He's an atheist. And he goes through and he lists all the things that gave Western civilization the edge. And the last one he comes to is num number six. He says, this is the greatest one, and it pains me to say it, but the greatest influence for good in Western culture is Protestant evangelical Christianity. And he gives the example, if, you've, if you're familiar with the book, Six Killer Apps, the difference between South America and North America. They were settled by Europeans at exactly the same time. South America, rich in gold still, minerals, all kinds of uh, mineral resources, and it is largely a, a poverty-stricken continent. North America, United States, nowhere near the natural resources of South America. The difference was in South America, they had a state religion that, was, that had no inspiration to it, and in North America, they were settled by evangelical Protestants who had an evangelistic agenda. And the difference in the economies is staggering. And this comes from an atheist professor. So Christianity, we can easily argue, gives inspiration to the arts and the political arena. We know, and we've heard it, and I, I, Paul Henderson did a great job in briefly touching on this, that Germany's cultural climate at the time of the rise of Hitler, it wasn't evil. It wasn't evil. When Hitler wrote, was rising to power, Germany was not an evil place. The German people were not evil. But what had happened was Christian leaders had become unbiblical. Not non-biblical. There's a difference between non-biblical and unbiblical. We do lots of non-biblical things like the service times, the way we set up chairs. I won't find a Bible verse for that. They're non-biblical things. They're not bad. But when you're unbiblical, you're doing things against Scripture. And church leaders had become unbiblical in their theology. If you know anything about the rise of liberal theology, it was coming out of Germany. And that led to a distorted view of the Jewish people. It also led to an apathy in challenging Hitler. And this is what happened. And in his book, uh, Bonhoeffer, Eric Metaxas makes this point powerfully. And if you haven't read it, you need to read this book. It is a powerful statement. When I read this, I felt like crossing out the word Germany in the 1930s and putting Australia in the 21st century in the margin because it is, again, history repeating itself. We're seeing some of the same indicators. But he points out that the German church had failed to inspire culture with a biblically informed vision of God. He goes on in this book and he makes the point that consequently they lacked the courage to challenge its culture and especially Adolf Hitler. If you know anything about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, as a young man, 24 years of age I think he was, when he was on Deutsche Welle radio criticising Adolf Hitler <laughs> in the 1930s and he was taken off air before he finished his broadcast. And if you, you should know the rest of the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of the greatest men that have ever walked the planet. And so when, when we see culture affecting society, politicians take note of this. When politicians feel public support for their raft of, and I'm going to use this blanket statement, non-life policy agenda items, it's an indication of where culture is heading and added to this when politicians feel public support for this we we can see this is how you know the, the show q a it's a it's, it's a frustrating program half the time i can't watch it because i f don't want to ruin another tv and then you, you see <laughs> it's so it's bad my blood pressure and yet we see these sorts of things are giving politicians encouragement so when politicians take liberties with their non-life policy agenda, it actually feeds 
and in different culture. This is what I mean, that politics is a barometer. It drags culture along into a certain a, a, a agenda direction. It actually feeds a diet, which is just unbelievable that in Victoria, um, we, we have, an, I noticed the, uh, your comments in the, your letter about Jeff Shaw. Yeah, I'm taking note of Jeff Shaw. In Tasmania, I've heard, I'm, I'm taking note of Jeff Shaw, independent Victorian parliamentarian, who's making a brilliant case for life in the Victorian parliament. I don't know him, I don't know anything else about him, but man, he's doing a great job with his comments, uh, looking to protect the unborn. And yet we have a culture that is not only arguing completely irrationally about the cheapness of human life, they welcome it, they, they, they're feeding off it. And so this is a very, very dangerous direction, non-life policy agendas. And why is it happening? Well, I, I'm going to suggest that because it's happening, it makes our job, get this, a non-life policy agenda. And what's our main message as the Christian church? Eternal life, the ultimate life. And if we've got a culture that's viewing life as you want to commit suicide, yeah, we can help you do that. I mean, geez, don't blame you. Why would you want to live? So when we have people who, the, the, the expression sled, S-L-E-D, uh, uh, your size does not determine your value as a human being. Your location does not determine your value as a human being. Your environment does not determine your value as a human being. And D, your dependency levels do not determine your value as a human being, sled. S-L-E-D, the unborn, from conception, its size, its location, its environment, its dependency level, does not change its value as a human being. And when you've got a society that ignores all that, we are hurtling in a dangerous direction. And when they don't value life, and here we are offering eternal life, you can see the disconnect that we're going to have evangelistically, to see people come to know Christ. So the society is largely finding the, non, uh, the, the promotion of life almost repulsive, which is just bizarre. Who would have thought 100 years ago we'd be, that we could have foreseen these things happening? But, and here's the but, and this is where I want to give you some hope. It is possible for Christians to inspire culture with a biblical view of life by working cooperatively together and for me this started in 2004 when our state government at the time was looking to introduce same-sex couple adoption and we were able to, pre to prevent them from doing that. They then, uh, the, the, just when we were sort of wiping the sweat off our brow going boy that was close, they then introduced decriminalization of brothels and I actually had people, other Christians, go, well, that would be a good thing, wouldn't it? Clean up the industry, take drugs out of it, remove crime. And I could not believe it. In fact, I had this discussion at the time with the Australian Christian Lobby, who were a little bit indifferent to the matter, and I said, we can't be indifferent to this. Because again, if a woman is just a piece of meat to be used, it's going to be a dangerous cultural trend in society. And so we presented all the data to the Attorney, State Attorney General, uh, Judy Jackson at the time, who was no friend of Christians, and we showed her that in every instance where prostitution and brothels had been legislated for and decriminalised, in every instance we have an increase of crime, we have an increased health risk to the girls, and we have increased criminal, uh, criminal activity and drug use among the girls. So the very things you're trying to address actually it will make it worse. And she could see the data. We had data from Queensland, there was data that came in from Queensland and every other place around the world. Where it was a, and so 4.30 one afternoon I got a phone call from the then State Director of the ACL and said, you are not going to believe the phone call I just had. And he said, you better watch your TV tonight at 6 o'clock because the Attorney General is withdrawing her legislation and is introducing new legislation to increase the penalties if you are found operating a brothel. So I'm saying that 
to say it is possible to have a positive effect if you'd learn to do it wisely and winsomely. So, so this has been a part of our journey. Um, I want to compare two periods of English culture also to show you from history. You've heard this referred to. Uh, uh, Siobhan referred sort of to it, but this period, 1740 to 1780, fascinates me. If you are into evangelicalism, you know this is where it started. This is John Wesley, George Whitfield. John Wesley was not the greatest preacher, but he had a go and he kept going. That's the th outstanding thing. But the other 50% of his ministry was his ability to organize. An amazing organizer. He developed a method, hence Methodist, Methodism. And he was able to consolidate his growth and it just profound the effect he had. But you know, the Methodist church didn't start during the time of John Wesley. It was still a branch of Anglicanism. And yet, at the end of that 40 year period, there was no substantial net growth in the church across England. Amazing, hundreds of thousands of people giving their life to Christ, but they were already in the church. Culture has not changed, and there's a famous etching, and this is where I want to introduce the next 40-year period. It happened just after this. It's 1793 to 1833. And anyone who's looked at the interplay of faith and politics will know exactly what happened in England during that time. And so we have this, this other era where there were no preaching evangelists. There, were, there was no John Wesley's or George Whitfield's. There was no great revival. And yet, if you look at church attendance in every denomination across England during that 40-year period, they go up on a very, very steep curve. What happened? Well, what happened was largely one man, William Wilberforce, arguing for decency and morality, not even arguing for Christianity, just decency and morality. His motto was to reform the reformation of manners. The reformation of, he wanted to introduce good manners. That's all he wanted to do. And what, what does that look like? It looks like how you treat women. Women were treated like dirt in England at this time. He wanted to reform how children were treated. Children were treated like trash in that period. There's, there's etchings where they're sent into coal mines and factories and, and the, the, the new industrial age is being birthed on the backs of dead children. This was a horrible time. And we have, we have the, 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 the elite practicing all kinds of sexual proclivities. This was a debauched time. And then we have African English people. We talk about African Americans. So well, these were African English people who were abused. And William Wilberforce is most famously thought of as eradicating slavery. He didn't. And he never, and it's strategically, and I think it's very important, he didn't even try to eradicate slavery. He tried to eradicate the slave trade. And by doing that, if you can't buy or sell a slave, you've eradicated slavery. That's thinking strategically, and that I go, wow, I could learn a few things from this guy. So when we look at this period, church attendance goes through the roof. Why? Because all he did was just give the standard of right and wrong and what was decent and good-mannered. And so you had these Anglican vicars out in the boondocks preaching that Jesus Christ can forgive you of sin, and suddenly people recognize that they were sinners who needed forgiveness. But if you're in a culture that says, it's not sin, nothing wrong with it. We've got laws to say you can do it. We've got laws to promote it. <laughs> Culturally, you can see the difficulty we've got as Christians. That's why it's important to be involved. So let me come back to my 1970s example. In 1970, something happened in Australia, the introduction of seatbelts. I remember it. <laughs> and I remember my parents refusing to put their seatbelts on. Don't need these newfangled things. <laughs> been driving for all the time I don't know I've never needed one I don't need one now in the FJ you'll be right <laughs> I think it was 1963 Philip they actually hold and put the seat belt mounts in without seat belts so if you wanted to put a seat belt in you could but Holden drivers apparently never had accidents so you, you didn't actually need them that was apparently the thinking. But in 1970, it was made law. And with that law, I remember being in primary school and, and we, we had to watch films on why, you know, people crashing and, and this is why 
children, you need to get in and put your... And so there's a whole education campaign that came with seatbelts. Now, what happens when you get in a car now? You automatically... You don't even think about it. It's become a part of culture. And this is where, if I had the time, and I haven't, but the idea you can't legislate morality, I would say you can only legislate morality. Morality is a statement of what's right or what's wrong. (laughs) And if we're saying you can't legislate morality, I'm saying you mean that none of our laws are right? You can only legislate morality. Who's morality? That's the question. And this is why I think Christians need to be involved in the process because if anybody's got an, an idea, an inkling of what's right and wrong, please let it be us. Please. So... In a, so you got the idea, seatbelts. What happened with seatbelts? Well, it addressed a serious and growing issue and seatbelts was a very workable solution. We've heard this today. Don't just address the problem, come up with a workable solution. Now, I don't know if it was a Christian who developed the idea of seatbelts, but, but can you begin to see where I'm going here? It, it should have been or it could have been, and if it wasn't, it's, it, there's a valuable lesson here. Now, seatbelts, you might think, this isn't preaching the gospel. Yeah, but it's showing care for society. And if we're, if we're showing care, we're positioning ourselves culturally to be received for the message that we've got. So uh, it became a community dialogue. They just didn't say, by decree, we're introducing it. They began to talk about it. They began to talk about the problem. Every good preacher knows that if you're going to have an effective message, you have to first present the problem, then you present the solution. And as Christians, we just need to carry this into the political marketplace as well. And a reasonable case for change was, was made. And I think this, is a, the, the, this becomes a metaphor for how we can go about doing this. And finally, an education campaign was instigated. Now, I'm saying all that to say this is a part of the backdrop, the fabric for me of going, why should I get involved in politics? I, I, I pastor a church in Tasmania. It's a, you know, I'm, I'm in a, when I came to the town I'm in, it was 1,500 people. And uh, you know, I, I understand what Siobhan was saying before, but I have met just about every one of our parliamentarians. I have worked hard to build relationships with them. I hold um, several dinners and events throughout the year. One dinner, um, I had the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia come and speak at it. I had six of our 12 Tasmanian senators. I had uh, several of our state parliamentarians. I held, a, I held a breakfast just a few weeks ago. I had ministers of the government there. Um, I had our, our mayor. And just recently, I was involved with the church service where I had every member, every member of the government except one, was there. And I want to show you a clip from that because this was, th- th- I never, <laughs> I just never thought I'd see the day. Knowing in 2004 the direction Tasmania was going and knowing that last year, for the second time within three years, our state parliament tried to introduce euthanasia. And again, you know, it was like, oh, what again? We just finished dealing, I've had to deal with euthanasia three times in the time I've been in Tasmania, three times it's been introduced into our parliament, and every time it gets crushed. And they keep coming back, they keep coming back, they keep coming back. So knowing that, and knowing that sometimes, you know, when it says in Ephesians 6, having done all, stand. (laughs) And knowing that you stand, and there's that having done all. So when you've done all, you are weary, you are battle fatigued, you, you, you feel discouraged, you have Christians telling you that, look, don't you think you need to give this a rest? And you just keep standing, and then you go to a church service in Hobart where I was invited to be a part of and uh, the, the newly elected Premier of Tasmania who also has been having relationships with church leaders cultivated over the last 12 to 24 months and it was about six months ago that he went to with the church of a pastor who were just, let's have coffee. And he went to that church with his family, no tie on that day dragging kids along who were kicking and screaming and making a noise in church and he sat in that church service not as the opposition leader but as Will and he came back again 
and he sat in the back and he came back again and he came back again and about about six seven months ago he gave his life to christ and it was reported in a two-page spread in the australian when they did a major interview on him about a month before the tasmanian election and i'm just stunned that no one's made any fuss about it at all now, in light of all that I've told you, in light of I'm telling you that when we get in the game, it results in souls getting saved. And I'm going to now show you, this is just historic for me because I was in St. David's Cathedral at this church service and I saw this. Whoops, here we go. Principal high place, Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said... That's a 15-second Instagram that I did because as I realised what was happening, I quickly grabbed my iPhone and thought, I need to document this because there was no other video cameras or anything going. And I, had to docu I wanted to document the Premier of Tasmania reading Solomon's prayer to God for wisdom to govern his people well. <laughs> I'm pinching myself. This is the Premier of Tasmania beseeching God for wisdom to govern well? It was a good day that day. It was a good day. Now, let me tell you about the Salamanca Declaration. We became, before this last election, in fact, a year ago, the Salamanca Declaration is just over a year old. We were aware of the Manhattan Declaration. We were aware of the Canberra Declaration. We were, we were aware of the, the, the Manhattan Declaration uh, instigated by Chuck Colson and Eric Metaxas and, and a couple of others and how they, they got church leaders from across America to sign up on it. And so I, I, myself and a few others said, look, our state is heading in a direction where in the last 12 months, twice, same-sex marriage as a state bill has been introduced. Secondly, abortion has been introduced for the second or third time. And fourthly, we've got euthanasia being introduced for the second time in three years. Good grief, this thing's not going away. And so what can we do as a church? So the, the process began where I'm, I, we, we, after the, the last uh, parliamentary prayer breakfast, I met with a few key leaders. And, and I've been cultivating relationships with bishops, moderators, archbishops for the last 10 years in particular. And that will often involve, and this is, this is something that I've, I've been watching parliamentarians, they, it's their job to connect with people. They don't connect, they don't get voted back in. And I'm watching this, I'm thinking, you know, I have invited parliamentarians, I've found this, generally when I invite a parliamentarian to an event where I know I'm going to get a few people, they will come. And they will expect to sit in the front row. They're not going to say anything, do anything, but they're my guest and they know it and I know it too. And I've had people say to me, don't you think they're using you? I go, just be careful about who's using who here. <laughs> and so... Uh, I, I began to think, you know, what happened? All these invites I get from other churches. Oh, could you come to our event? Could you come, pa Andrew? Could you come to this? Could you come? I began to have an attitude. I'm going to say yes to everything. And I know that's not good practice. But I began to say yes to everything. And that meant that I would get in my car and I'd drive to a, somewhere in Tasmania to, to be at a, a whatever, just be there, get in my car and drive two or three hours back home. And I began to do that. And when we formed the Salamanca Declaration, we met with these group and, and we said, what are the key issues? Well, we're dealing with devaluing of life. That's the number one issue, life. Life doesn't matter anymore. We said, yes, it does. Whether you're in the womb or whether you're in a nursing home, it matters. Whether you're happy or whether you're sad, your life is of the same value. Then we, we began to see, uh, so we've got... Uh, religious freedom. Uh, there was talk of Tasmania going in the direction that Victoria has gone and there is no way I wanted to go where Victoria was going with religious liberty. Uh, having, th there, was, there was proposals that we, we could be 
charged with hate speech if we read public, publicly read certain parts of the Bible. This is what's going on in Canada at the moment. And you, you might think, give it a rest, that'll never happen. It's happening. It's happening. And I didn't want it to go that way. So hate speech. We wanted f- religious liberty. And then, of course, marriage, the undermining of marriage. And um, we, we wanted to address that. Well, he, so here's our life, religious liberty, and marriage. And so we, we had to think about, okay, we're thinking in terms of Twitter. We're thinking in terms of sound bites. We're thinking in terms of how hard it is to get media attention. So we had to reduce that to three key words that are easy, easy, easy to remember. Life, liberty, legacy. The, the best legacy you can give our state is a child well raised. What's the best way to raise a child? With its biologically married parents. Life, liberty, legacy. Three key words. I then met, I, I drove down sometimes once a week for a 10 minute meeting, two and a half hour car trip each way to meet with not the bishop and not the archbishop and not the moderator, but their assistants, the people, their, 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 their assistant secretary, blah, blah person. And so here I am dealing with indirectly, I'm having to talk to the archbishop through his assistant and, I'm ha- and we're having to have these covert meetings. And we said, everything we do has to be secretive. We can't tell anybody what we're doing. And for nine months, we c- can you believe it? I had, I had the key leaders of the Tasmanian church for nine months keep a secret. There is a God. <laughs> and so for nine months, we worked on this document and I framed it and we'd come back and sometimes they'd want to change a word and then we'd have to, and I'd go back and I'd change it and I'd send it out and I had to wait. You know what it's like working with a committee? It was frustrating, but I thought it's a frustration I've got to go through because this is important. And so we went through this and eventually we honed it. We got it dialed down. We brought in toward the end, once we got it pretty right, we brought in Professor Michael Tate, uh, former, I think, uh, Attorney General of Australia, who left politics to become a Catholic priest, who's in Hobart, who's the professor of constitutional law at the University of Tasmania and a Catholic priest. And we got him to look at it and go, are we in legal trouble? Said, no, no. And he said, you know, we we sort of changed a couple of things just so his fingerprints were on it. But essentially we've got life begins at conception. Life is valuable right up until your last breath. You don't deliberately take a human life. We've got, you have the right to freely worship and freely express your views shaped by that worship of God. And children raised by married biological parents is the best way to raise, not the only way, but the best way to raise children. And once we had that dialed down, we then, within a matter of days, contacted every major church leader in the state. And every one of them agreed to sign off on it. I want to show you some pictures of that happening because it was a historic day. Added to that, we got the media involved. We had a big media event and we caught the parliament off guard. For the rest of that day, the only thing discussed essentially in parliament was what we had done on what they thought was that day. Here's some photos. And I, I'm not sure if this is going to play automatically or not. This is the Bishop of Tasmania with his research assistant. This is Archbishop Adrian Doyle, head of the Roman Catholic Church. A very good man. Uh, Bishop John Harrower. Uh, Tim O'Neill uh, from A2A and Peter Shirley, the head of the Australian Christian Churches in Tasmania. These are the signatories, each of the heads of churches. <coughs> There's uh, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, uh, Baptist. Uh, this was the press event. We, we got Claire Van Ryan. We wanted a pretty young face, good on camera. We had thought this through. That's why we had a pretty young <laughs> face. There. Uh, that's Reen Hitting, handing it to the Speaker of the House. It was tabled. It is now a legal document and we cannot be sued. We have political and legal immunity from it. There with the heads of the churches, uh, each holding our copy of it. There we are in front of Parliament House. Every, uh, 18 
We had 18 leaders of churches. Bishop John Harrow were defending the Salamanca Declaration. Uh, Adrian Doyle speaking to the media about it. We were all on song. And then this was the Mercury's cartoon. Um, I don't even wear glasses, so I don't know how accurate it was. This is the Salamanca Declaration. This is actually that document in, in here, uh, the actual uh, signatories. This is a very historic document. It's never going on eBay. It's the actual uh, signatures of the bishops and archbishops and moderator of the Australian Presbyterian Church who happened to be in Tasmania at that time. Every major church leader signed it. And I've got one copy if someone wants a copy. Um, Paul Henderson was talking about eschatology shaping how you see these issues. I gave Paul a, a, a great presentation this morning, Paul. Um, Hannah? First four people can have a copy of my book on eschatology. And I guess I've, I've just, I'm open to any questions you might have. time and relationship and coffee uh, seriously Lo lots of um, as I said I, I began to going to so so the cathedral um, they they had um, events on every time they invited me to one of their events I said yes I went to it so they got to know me uh, I had uh, last year I did 10 weddings and and uh, Several of those were in Anglican churches where you're not allowed, unless you're an Anglican priest, that you, you do not have orders in, in their sense to marry in their churches. I got special dispensation from the bishop to be able to marry in Anglican churches. We then had to bury someone in an Anglican cemetery. The bishop wrote a special order giving me grace to bury in an Anglican cemetery. And that came about... I, no, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying that... I took a lot of time to cultivate that relationship. Three weeks ago, I held a public meeting in the largest indoor venue in Launceston. I invited the Anglican bishop to be there. He said, yes. I said, will you come and pronounce the benediction? He drove up from Hobart to kind of return the favour and he pronounced the benediction. We had just under a thousand people there. So there's that kind of relationship. And as you know, I'm doing a documentary on F.W. Borum, so I've kind of got a, a kudos with the Baptists as well. They're, they're very, you know, and then I'm reformed in my theology, so the Presbyterians love me as well. So I'm kind of, I've built, Pentecostals aren't that fussy about me, but, but I speak in tongues, so I'm okay. <laughs> <coughs> Does that answer the question, Rick? Yes, sir. How does the Tasmanian culture that's different now that you've got that declaration in place? Because you saw it coming from the I see that we've started something that needs to be built on. We then put the Salamanca Declaration online, uh, Believe in Tasmania. We, we're using a vehicle called Believe in Tasmania. We just see that as a double entendre. And we, we have uh, a facility there where people can sign the Salamanca Declaration electronically. We now have... Um, uh, the, the parliament said no, 18 church leaders pff, big deal we said that, that the numbers the numbers represent uh, something like 170,000 people according to the census that those 18 people represent but then when we put it on within, a, within no time at all we had over 1,047 people electronically sign the Salamanca Declaration around Tasmania so um, it, we see it as the start. It, it's, it's become the, the start. So now when I go to their events, there, there's not, you know, as Rick would say, oh, gee, Andrew's here, what does he want? It's like, oh, Andrew's here, come on. You know, it's that kind of thing. It's, it's started something. It's not the end. 
And this is the difference between a war and a battle, isn't it? Okay, we, we won a battle. There'll be other ones. Philip. Well, we, we feel, yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, well, Salamanca Declaration was instigated uh, 13 months out from the state election, and every parliamentarian, with the exception of one, uh, um, well, what, what happened was we had by-elections after that and every parliamentarian who, who bagged the Salamanca Declaration lost their seat. And, and, and I, I began to say to these other parliamentarians, are you seeing a pattern here? <laughs> and we had two... The, the Greens Party would, were um, drastically reduced. I can't say decimated because that means reduced by 10%. But if I say... They, <laughs> And I hate it when people say decimated and they don't know what they're talking about. So, anyway, the Greens were—they—they're down to um, you know three members now, and um, they only just just got them, and um, and they were obviously the the biggest opponents of it, um, and and they've been wiped out. They no longer have party status in the in the parliament now. So, is, is there a? Were we riding sentiment or were we, as I'm suggesting, helping to create sentiment? So, changing, I hope so, Rick. Well, I think I'm done. Thank you.